Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Joined as a, an aircraft apprentice in, in 1959, uh, did a three year apprenticeship and uh, the Air Force fortunately for me was very short of aircrew, particularly pilots and navigators. Um, and about eight of us from my apprentice entry of 180 managed to get uh, direct entry commissions and, uh, and I was selected as a pilot which was exactly what I'd always wanted to do um, and uh, from there I went through flying training, jet provost, uh, NAT, hunter lead into lightning. Of course the lightning was the new fighter in those days and that was a very exciting machine to start flying. <laughs> um, went to Goodisloe with the squadron, 19 squadron, which was the first lightning squadron ever to deploy out of UK permanently. Um, spent three years at Goodisloe and then fortunately the, the TSR-2 was cancelled, I say fortunately because um, that enabled me to fly the Phantom with the first Phantom course uh, in 1968 uh, and I spent many many years either flying the Phantom or associated with it um, until eventually the Tornado came into service and uh, I flew the Tornado ADV for a number of years. Um, the icing on the cake was I also flew Battle of Britain Memorial Flight Spitfire Hurricane for a number of years, um, not long enough actually, <laughs> and then uh, went to Leeming with the um, Tornado F3 um, and at the end of that tour I went to Saudi Arabia and uh, spent 10 years there um, training the Saudis. Yes, I'm going to get on to that, but uh, yeah, tell us a bit about your time on the Tornado, how do you feel coming from obviously the Phantom, everyone loves the Phantom, but did you enjoy your time in the RAF flying the Tornado? Oh gosh, yeah, I was incredibly fortunate really, I, 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 I did uh, get uh, um, punished with a staff tour um, when I'd had a, an exchange tour in the States, I think they felt that it was time I, I, I did something which was not quite so enjoyable, um, and I went to the Ministry of uh, procurement executive and uh, attempted to be an author of aircrew manuals and pilot's notes and um, I managed to escape that job um, by going to Staff College um, and when I left Staff College I went to Central Tactics and Trials Organisation at High Wycombe and in a way I was fortunate there because the Falklands War occurred while I was there and we were able to do a lot of the things that we knew we always wanted to do um, but couldn't get the money for and uh, the project I got most closely involved in was laser guided bombs <coughs> and uh, it was quite gratifying at the, uh, towards the end of the Falklands War to be able to send them some laser guidance kits for the thousand pounders mm -hmm. with instructions on how to use them um, because we'd done a quick trial to make sure it all worked um, and the Harriers were able to use them at the end of the war um, to, to considerable effect although not many drops were, were, were made. Um, so that was an enjoyable staff tour, but uh, I, I really couldn't see another desk after that. Mm. And so I became specialist aircrew, which enabled you to continue to fly um, and, and not have to sit behind a desk normally. <laughs> um, but I could see another desk coming at the end of my tour at Leeming, and that was one of the reasons why I wanted to go to Saudi Arabia, um, apart from the money, of course. <laughs> So we're here to talk about your exchange um, to it in Saudi Arabia. How did that come about? It came about um, primarily because um, <clears throat> up until not long before I went to Saudi, um, the, the Tornado ADV training um, was done in UK. Um, and uh, then the simulator was ready um, a full mission simulator which they needed to train the ab initios um, and the training system basically moved from Coningsby to Saudi Arabia and they were looking for people. Um, one or two people had been there for a while and, and were due to leave and I managed to 
get a job replacing one of those people. Um, and uh, that seemed like a very good option to me. Um, better than flying a desk, that for sure. And, and we'd already been there for Gulf War I. We deployed when soon after the invasion of Kuwait. Um, so I knew what I was getting into and where I was getting into it. <laughs> <laughs> so was there much competition to get that kind of uh, that slot? I don't know because um, you never found out if there was any competition or not. Um, but but obviously it was at that stage it was one in one out, um, so you had to wait until there was a vacancy, um, and uh, then of course you had to make make sure that it was approved at all the different levels. Um, and it was viewed, I think, quite rightly as a very important contract for UK, um, and there was a great deal of uh, investment in it um, as a result. Did you have to have a certain amount of hours? before you could go over that? Um, not that I was aware of, but obviously they're looking for experienced people, people who were capable of instructing them, um, and people who were, um, in my case, able to instruct from the back seat of the tornado, um, because not everybody was qualified to do that. Mm -hmm. And what squadron and base were you assigned to? I went to Dharan, um, 29 Squadron, um, which was interesting. I'd already been on 29 Squadron Phantoms in the UK. Um, but it was an entirely different sort of squadron. Um, and a very interesting um, transition, really, because I'd, I'd had a tour in the States on exchange um, and obviously experienced their training system and their way of operating. And, of course, a lot of the Saudi Air Force had also trained in the States, and their Air Force tended to operate in a, in a sort of um, hybrid way as Royal Air Force and United States Air Force. And they picked, I think, quite rightly, the best from both air forces. and um, So their system of operating was more closely aligned with the Americans than, than ours. Um, but some of them had already flown uh, the Lightning, in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was the Lightning that, that really enthused the Saudi pilots. And, and the ex-Lightning people on the Tornado were um, they were a little bit disappointed with the, the, the change in performance, let's put it that way. I can imagine. So yeah, let's talk about the F3. Was there much difference from the RAF F3s? Not an enormous difference. There, there were some differences. Um, the Saudis w were quite insistent that their, their Tornado F3 should be identical to the RAF F3, um, with one major exception, um, mm -hmm. which was very good for them, actually. They, they had auto wing sweep, auto maneuver devices, um, which took a great deal of the workload off the pilot, particularly in combat. And I think it was something in the RAF that we never realized um, how effective it was. We, we knew that a well-trained pilot could beat the automatic system any day, um, a bit like the difference between an automatic sports car and a manual gearbox sports car. Um, but of course, that depended on what else you were doing at the time. Um, and uh, well, the Royal Air Force has certainly lost one uh, Tornado F3 through not having auto wing sweep. That was an unfortunate case where the wings were far too far back for the speed at which the aircraft was traveling. Mm. Um, but in Saudi service, it was, it was a blessing, it really was. And, and uh, I mean, it's just a shame the RAF never had it. Um, I'm guessing it came down to money, essentially, and Saudis have a lot of that. Well, it came down to um, the RAF not being particularly keen on having it to begin with, and, and of so course the, the pressure for budgets and, and uh, all the test equipment, for example, was, was, was due to be procured, mm -hmm. and that saved quite a lot of money, which could be spent elsewhere. Um, and when the RAF wanted to go back to having auto wings with auto maneuvers, um, there were no test equipment, and, and obviously the whole thing was going to be far too expensive. So. That's the thing I didn't think about. Yeah, the test equipment, you just think, oh yeah, it's just one little mechanism, but it's probably a big deal. Yes, it is a big deal, and, and, and um, also because it, you know, because it moves the, the, uh, the flaps and slats, um, and, and uh, it, it, it's quite important that it works properly. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and so you need to make sure it's, it's, you know, that you keep up with it on the engineering side. Yeah, yeah. so just going off track a bit here. So when you came to the Saudi, did you automatically go for the sweep or did you, or did it, was it instinct straight away, just leave it alone and get on with it? Uh, you tended to go for the wing sweep lever quite, quite frequently. And of course, rather like an automatic car, you know, you touch the brakes and, and um, you know, that, that disengages or effectively stops the engines from driving the, the gearbox. Um, probably more um, 
similar to cruise control in that if you put your foot on the brake, you've lost your cruise control setting. And of course, if you touch the wing sweep lever, you've lost your automatic wing sweep. Um, so you've got to re-engage it again. So was the role of the F3 with the Saudis exactly the same as the REAC, an interceptor, essentially? Essentially, yes. Um, I'm not sure that they were actually looking for a long-range interceptor, which is what the Tornado F3 was designed to do. I mean, it was designed to be able to go out and cap 600 miles from base. And, and come back again. Um, that wasn't quite what the Saudis wanted it for, but, but it was nice to have the, the time airborne, um, and it gave quite a lot of flexibility in that respect. Mm -hmm. So can you talk us through your initial training, or was there any always jumping straight into uh, being an instructor? Uh, well, I'd already instructed for years on Phantoms, um, so it was not difficult to transition to the rear cockpit of the Tornado but I hadn't had a lot of experience in the back cockpit um, up until then because I, I was basically flying either on the operation evaluation unit um, or else on, on the squadron. Um, so it was in that respect um, something slightly new to me um, because you've got to learn to be a good navigator and give the guy in the front cockpit good service. You know, I'd never pretend to be a good navigator, but, <laughs> but you know, I always tried to give the guy in the front cockpit reasonable service, um, and, and that was a bit tricky if you hadn't spent much time in the back seat. Yeah. So how were you welcomed when you first arrived on the squadron? Welcomed, really, as, as, as somebody who would be an asset to, to their program, because they, they had uh, the problem of converting um, quite a few new people to the aeroplane and uh, I think they, they probably benefited greatly from having a few Brits who have some experience. So can you talk us through some of the training you'll be conducting over there? Yes, it was very, very similar to the sort of training that the Royal Air Force did. Um, and, and you start with uh, simulator training, well, ground school first, then simulator training, and, and then uh, transition sorties to learn how to fly the aeroplane or learn how to navigate the aeroplane. Um, and then in, basic uh, air interception work um, by day, by night, um, air-to-air -air refueling, dissimilar air combat training, um, and so on. Very, very similar to the RAF. And obviously you mentioned you were in the back there, I'm guessing it was a twin sticker. Yes, we never flew in a single sticker as pilots. <laughs> <laughs> but, but of course our, our, our navigators who were there, also um, helping to train the Saudis, didn't have a stick. Um, um, and of course, when you're dealing with inexperienced pilots um, who perhaps have not quite the same language skills as you have, and you're trying to communicate um, and uh, be an effective crew, you know, that, that's a bit tricky for the backseaters. And I took my hat off to them um, because there were occasions when I found difficulty in the back seat communicating effectively with a guy in the front seat <laughs> whose, whose English perhaps wasn't quite as or quite the same as mine, um, but I couldn't speak Arabic, so <laughs> you know, I didn't blame him for that. Of course, um, yeah. Was there any frustration there on your part, or maybe his part as well? Probably frustration on both parts, mm. I would think, because you know what communication's like. If you misunderstand each other, um, it can lead to all sorts of um, unfortunate circumstances. So yeah, you said you're obviously uh, instructing uh, the new pilots, but was there anyone who came from like the Lightning or another aircraft that you had to train on the Tornado? I didn't personally uh, teach anybody who'd come from Lightnings in the, in the past to, to fly the Tornado in Saudi. Um, but we had a number on the squadron, um, particularly among the more senior officers on the squadron. Um, and they were the ones who spoke highly of their time on Lightnings. <laughs> so a good conversation was had probably with them. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah. So did you get paired with one pilot or was it just a mix every day? Normally at the beginning of a course you'd, you'd have one or two um, pilots to train. Um, as, as a pilot instructor um, and uh, you worked primarily with those but obviously um, you also flew with the uh, Saudi navigators um, and, and helped to train those. Uh, how, how, how would that happen? Would that be on the ground I'm guessing? No, no, in the air. Oh, so you, um, you were in the front seat at this point? Yes. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah. And, and it was, I mean, the first the first Saudi I flew with um, was, was a backseater, a young, experience, inexperienced backseater and uh, I was um, I was quite surprised because I was doing the external checks and, and, and I almost fell over him because he was prostrate on, on, on the um, floor of the hangar and or the hardened shelter and, and 
I said, what's the matter? What's the matter, Mohammed? And he said, well, I, I'm, 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 I'm praying. So I, I shut up and let him carry on praying because he'd missed the prayer call. And, and so he felt obliged to, to make his prayer. But when I first saw him and he told me he was praying, I thought, you know, what does he know about my flying that I don't? Because <laughs> it quite concerned me because we, we hardly knew each other. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yes, you had to be aware of the cultural differences. And, and uh, I think, you know, we had to make allowances for, for them disappearing to the mosque um, during the normal working day. And um, of course, they, they made. Um, they had to put up with us too in our, our, our attempts to communicate with them. So. How did you rate them as pilots? One or two of them were very, very good pilots. Um, by and large, they were not quite as proficient as, as the people I'd worked with in the RAF. Um, but bear in mind that um, for a lot of them, you know, they, they, they were training in a, a language that was not their language of birth. Um, it was a culture which was alien. A, our culture was obviously alien to them, <laughs> as theirs was to us. Um, and uh, yeah, by and large, they, they, they were a very proficient bunch, um, with some very, very good pilots, and some that normally we wouldn't have accepted onto our squadrons. So we're going to talk about DACT. Did you manage to conduct any over there? Because did they have the F-15s at the time? Yes, the Saudis had the, the F-15 C model, I believe it was, um, which is one of the, the earlier models. And uh, yes, we did quite a lot of DACT with them. Um, and uh, refreshingly, the Saudi ADV crews did very well against the F-15s. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I think a lot of that shows the difference between single crew aircraft and a multi-crew aircraft. Um, the Tornadoes, I think, generally did better when it was a busier scenario, um, because you can, you can imagine for a, a single pilot aircraft, you know, the workload um, normally is easy to deal with, but if other things are happening around him, um, that the scenario is changing, or or a lot of people talking on the radio, and and, the, and maybe the whole the whole battle plan changes, um, we were better able to deal with that, and and. It suited the Saudis, I think, better to have two crew in the aeroplane. Okay. Um, and, yeah, so how, how often would you conduct DACT? Would it be like every week? No, not as often as that, unfortunately. Um, but, but it was an occasional um, thing. And did you ever interact with any other nations that like, were located near there, or even like the Americans if they were visiting, anything like that? Um, I can't remember dealing with, with that. We, we had one or two exercises where there may have been other forces involved, but I can't remember. I mean, I, it, it's going back a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> so how often actually would you fly? Um, gosh, it's it very difficult to tell. Probably as much as they flew in the RAF. Um, I only flew with them for three years of the 10 I was there um, because I went initially on, on uh, secondment, they called it, where I was still in the RAF. Um, but flying with the Saudis, um, and uh, then a vacancy came up in the in the Saudi simulator um, to join the company, and I was not that far from retiring anyway from the RAF, um, and uh, so I jumped at the opportunity. I would have stayed and flown with the company, but I was too old. Um, the, the company had a, a problem getting insurance for the people of my sort of age. I was about 53, I think, at the time. Um, well, obviously I didn't need the insurance in the simulator. Um, <laughs> so I moved to the simulator and, and, and taught in the simulator for seven years um, before I came back to UK. What kind of simulator was that? Was it similar to these days? It, like a big dome where so it was like you give you like a 3D kind of uh, view? It was a very more, much more advanced simulator than the ones the RAF had. Oh, um, really? It had full uh, motion and uh, a wraparound visual which was basically a TV tube system, um, which gave the front cockpit, uh, um, and we could do a lot more with it. Um, it was much, much more realistic to train people with. Um, in fact, it was, it was so good that we used it as a workup for the Gulf War, um, because it was still being uh, trialed in UK, um, and we were able to go and spend some time in that simulator, that very same simulator, and, and uh, learn some of the new weapon switchology because there were many changes for the Gulf War uh, weapon system on the RAF uh, F3. Um, and it was very useful in that respect. Mm -hmm. And obviously 
in Saudi it was extremely useful because we had some Evan issues um, and uh, we were doing the ground school and, and the simulator training and, and that really helped them to, to master the aircraft quite quickly. Mm. How did the heat affect the F3's uh, performance? Well, as you probably know, it, it, it was never a great, uh, an outstanding aircraft um, in terms of <laughs> performance. Uh, it, it had its merits, but um, the thrust weight ratio was not one of them. Um, although it wasn't too bad at sea level on a, on a, on a cold day. Um, in Saudi, its takeoff performance was still fine. Um, it was not one of those aircraft where you see the numbers at both ends of the runway on takeoff, and, and I never wanted to fly one of those. You know? And we didn't have to take fuel out to get airborne on a hot day, <laughs> you know, which some aircraft have done in the past. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it obviously ran out of breath more quickly um, with, with the temperature. Mm -hmm. um, and did you ever interact with the, the F-15 guys and stuff like that to you know, swap tactics or anything like that? Not really, no. The communication between the squadrons was, was fairly sparse from what I could see. I mean, there was no, no bar to exchange talk um, within the... In, in the evenings, yeah. and, and an awful lot of RAF learning is, is crew room and bar, um, and uh, there was very little of that. Um, mm. they, they had a very nice crew room, which I spent some time in talking to them, and had some very interesting discussions um, with the younger lads, and uh, they co const constantly seemed to try and convert me to Islam, which um, didn't quite work. Um, I never dared try and convert to Christianity because you know Bibles were banned, mm -hmm. and if you're caught with the Bible, you're in trouble. And, mm -hmm. and uh, um, obviously, we were very sensitive to their culture um, because we were in their country, and it's uh, you know it's it's quite a nice thing that people who visit other people's country um, mm -hmm. are actually sensitive to what to what goes on in their country. Absolutely. Yeah. But what was it like, you know? Typical RAF was uh, Friday night happy hour. What was so? What was typical for you uh, on a Friday night? Well, I'm not sure how much I can reveal, but um, you know, obviously alcohol was banned. Um, of course. But you you could recognise an expat in a supermarket because he had a he had a trolley with uh, lots of fruit juice and lots of sugar, and and some baking um, yeast. What? So, um, and of course, you know, it, it, you did wonder why he needed all those ingredients, but. Mm. Um, Anyway, some pretty rotten stuff was drunk um, while I was there. I can imagine. Um, but obviously not by me. But no, 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 of course no, not. No, no, no. Not by any of the Brits, no. no. no, no. <laughs> so I want to know about, uh, if you can talk us through a brief and a debrief, how that worked and how it differed from the RAF. It wasn't different at all, really. Um, the, the, the morning briefing was much the same. Um, we, we in the RAF um, probably invented the Met briefing in the morning um, because we're always talking about the weather. Um, it was largely superfluous, really, to be talking about the weather most of the year in Saudi, although they did get the odd um, dust storm, um, which, which I, I remember very well many years ago on Phantom as we went to Italy and, and uh, our squadron commander got quite cross with the Italian meteorologist who, who, who tended to make life too easy, really, for himself. He'd, he'd say, the weather over whole Italian regions is cavoke, and walk out. And, and the boss got a bit upset with it. He thought that was a bit sparse. So he said, can we have more detail, please, on, on, on your weather briefings? And the next day he came in and he said, the weather in Grazanitsi is Kavoke. The weather in Joya is Kavoke. <laughs> and, and, and so on, you know. And, and Saudi is much the same. They still had the Met briefing in the morning. Um, in, and that's probably something that peculiar to our, our training. Um, but... Uh, but that could lead to problems because, um, I mean, one, one day, not long after the Met briefing, I was, I was taken to one side by uh, one of the Saudi majors who, who was quite a, an affable chap. And he, he said, Paddy, he said a quiet word. He said, um, your breath smelt of alcohol this morning. They were talking about it. And I said, well, it couldn't possibly have been my breath because, you know, I, 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 I may not be a saint, but I haven't had a drink since the weekend. <laughs> And uh, I, I was, I mean, the, the stuff was mostly rubbish that was available there, and, and I tended not to drink any of it during the week. But then I realised I'd sat next to one of our backseaters who, who had a reputation for, and I hadn't noticed it on him, but obviously it was his breath that they were smelling. Um, and he was and, a Brit. And he was a Brit, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I, 
I don't know whether the Major had a friendly word with him or not, but obviously um, that sort of thing was heavily frowned upon. And uh, the standard expression was, we like a window or an aisle seat. Um, <laughs> Of course. So yeah, let's talk a bit about the language barrier in these briefs. Like, was it, yeah, again, frustration on both parts, but is there anything you couldn't get across just because they couldn't comprehend or didn't understand that you really needed them to know? Not particularly. Their English was actually quite good in most cases. Um, maybe a few expressions that, that we might use would, would have been new to them. So you had to be quite, quite careful how you describe things. But you also had to watch the sensitivities. I mean, the, the Tornado F3, probably like the bomber, um, has a couple of devices. One's called a cross-feed for the fuel system, um, and one's called a cross-drive for the gearbox system. But of course, the word cross um, has religious conno connotations, which they found unacceptable. And, and so our publications had to be changed and the way we described them had to change. And we, we, we were encouraged not to refer to them as cross-feed, cross-drive, and in the publications they were, they were mentioned as X-feed and X-drive, and then both cultures were happy. Um, right, okay. But those sort of things, you know. Like could, little things like that. Yeah. Little things like that, yeah, which, which um, could mean a lot. Um, and you had to be very careful that what you were doing was not taken the wrong way. I mean, you could, end up with an accusation of insulting their religion, which was a bit serious. So were you kind of on your toes all the time thinking, like, thinking ahead what you were going to say? You had to watch what you were saying, yes, and if you said the wrong thing to the wrong person, as I said before, you know, window or aisle, sir, mm, yeah. which would you prefer? Um, so did you mix socially a lot with them, and did you obviously talk about flying? We didn't mix much socially, although there were frequent invite. I was invited to, to a wedding, which you know I'd, I'd very much like to have attended, but when my wife found out that she'd be taken to one side of the house and I'd be taken to the other, um, we decided not, not to go to it, which was a shame. But um, infrequently we socialised. Um, I mean, one of the best opportunities was when um, they were considering updating their radar um, to the same standard as the RAF, because the RAF had a big radar up upgrade. Um, and we brought uh, a group of them to UK, um, to Coningsby, and, uh, and uh, around the bazaars looking at the ramifications of the new radar. And of course we then had the opportunity to socialise with them in UK, um, which presumably they'd already done in many cases when they were training in UK. Yeah. And how did the Saudi pilots and NAVs feel about the F-3? Did they always want to maybe go on to the F-15 or what were their thoughts on the jet? Difficult to say really. I think most of the Saudis liked the F-3. Um, I think they enjoyed the flying they did with it. Um, it did become obvious to us not long before I left Saudi that, that uh, the F-3 wasn't going to run on for very much longer in Saudi. And of course when the RAF decided um, not to continue with the F-3, then uh, the Saudis had already moved to Typhoon by then. Mm. And was there any air shows over there, and did the F-3 ever get to display? I can't remember an F-3 displaying at an air show, um, but there were air shows, yeah. They, they formed a, a Hawk team, obviously, I, I presume, modelled on the Red Arrows. Yeah, um, very similar. Yeah. They, they were referred to as the Green Marrows, which was <laughs> not... because they were green. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how many F-3s did the Saudis actually have? Oh gosh, I can't remember the numbers. Um, basically, the, the one squadron of F3s, 20, oh, okay. 29 squadron. Um, and uh, I think that was all they had. I can't remember. Um, right. we, we certainly never trained anybody for any other squadron. So. And was it in service as long as the RAF? No. I, I think it was probably shorter, but I, once again, I can't remember. After I'd left Saudi in, in 2002, I lost track of exactly what was happening, but obviously Typhoon was already coming in shortly after that. 